Okay, moving on to our next speaker, and I'll do this very slowly while he gets mic'd up outside. Uh, Andy Chambers, it's hard to know how to prioritise the work he's done to introduce him, but if it helps, Andy's talking about making the most out of the range of available remote sensing tools. He's Managing Director at Airborne Logic and has a particular interest in embracing agri-technology for sustainable food production. He is also a specialist in water management and is using cutting edge technology to assist land managers to better understand and also to adopt sustainable land management practices. I could go on for much longer, but it's probably more interesting to hear it from him. Please welcome Andy Chambers. Thanks, Matt. Um, really good to be here. And, and one of the things I wanted to do, first of all, before I get cracking into trying to get onto that performing curve that Ollie talked about, was actually acknowledge the work that Ollie has done as part of the Collaboriculture project. He's put his heart and soul in the last couple of years into really developing that through. And I think um, in combination with the support from Persa State Government, uh, Wine Australia, et cetera, um, we had the last session on Collaboriculture yesterday uh, down in, in the city. And uh, yeah, it, it kind of almost felt like it was a bit of uh, an end of a journey. It's not, because I think it's really the start of a new journey. Um, but it was really, really good to sort of get to that point of seeing we're now talking about how we can get data uh, into a consistent format in that industry for, for wine. Uh, but it goes for all of the industries in horticulture and uh, viticulture, whatever it is that we're talking about from a crop perspective that uh, needs really, really good, consistent management of data behind it uh, and that's our challenge. Um, when you speak to some of the guys in at uh, the university, the machine learning uh, guys, they will talk to you about the importance of data for the future and I, I just don't think we're quite ready to understand exactly what that means in terms of the importance of that data but we're seeing some insights into that in companies like Ollie mentioned with, with Facebook, with Google that have all had this ability to capture huge amounts of data uh, and use it to their benefit but not necessarily to the benefit as us, for, for all of us as a, as a community. So we need to be very mindful uh, about that uh, and how we put that. So yeah, big thank you, Ollie. And I think you know if we can all just really, really acknowledge the work that, that people like Ollie have done uh, in, in our collective industries, it's uh, yeah, really, really good. So thanks, mate. Awesome. So um, yeah, making the most out of a range of available remote sensing tools, it's actually not what I'm going to talk about, but um, there'll be snippets of that all the way through it. It's actually about a journey. It's about the experiences that some people have had uh, in, in looking at mapping and looking at data and working their way through the relevancy of that to, as Ollie mentioned, create solutions to problems on farm. And it's fascinating when you look at all of the amounts of imagery that are available out, out there um, and you start asking these questions about what are we actually using that for? So I'll run through in a minute a bit more about what remote sensing means for those people that may not have even come across the term uh, of remote sensing uh, before. So uh, I think, um, just to uh, not get too, too ahead of myself, um, a lot of what we talk about in, in remote sensing is just building resilience. Ollie mentioned uh, the uh, sustainable uh, Wine Growing Australia program and really underneath of that you don't get too far if you don't have a base map and so building resilience whilst it's not all about having a base map it's about having a start point and it's about joining the sum of all of these things together and uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that as a pathway to um, you know I guess what we could have only dreamed uh, about some time ago uh, the, the amount of detail that we're now able to see through through imagery to give us deep insights into some of the problems that we have so um, a little bit about uh, what we do from a, a perspective of using drones accurately. Um, we'll talk more, or I will, about uh, how we're drilling right down into this area of remote sensing that is just getting down to smaller and smaller pixel size. But so what? You know, if we drown ourselves in all of this data and we can't actually physically use it, well, what's the point? Um, so we've got to find this pain point uh, in amongst all of that to, to work out what those deeper stresses are uh, for, for a grower. Um, so remote sensing, uh, I reckon I've skipped a couple of, uh, a couple of slides there, but that's cool. Uh, we'll keep going. Um, really remote sensing comes in many forms, satellite imagery, drone imagery, uh, aircraft imagery, and we've got some great suppliers here that uh, are essentially showing you what they can do in the tent next door, as well as many others that can't be here as well. So just a little bit of background. Satellite imagery has been around for a long time. There's a wide range of it around. Just a little bit of insight into 
where some of that uh, can come from, from a Google Earth perspective. Um, I'm not sure that auto slide's going to work, but it, uh, it does have a live link, but that's okay. What that was really showing was the emergence of pivot irrigation uh, out in the deserts uh, in uh, North Africa, and that growth over time. And this is the beauty of some of the imagery that we have available to us, is that we can actually compile a story over time. So um, regardless of whether that's satellite, or in this case, fixed wing, again, we've got lots of really good providers, uh, series here as well uh, today, uh, and others that uh, we're bouncing around with, having a look at different issues and different problems. They've all got deeper capabilities. Um, in fact, some of the guys I was having a chat to yesterday have put this whopping great big camera on a on a MIG jet, and it's ridiculous. It's not actually a it's not actually an aircraft. It's a camera with a jet on it. It's crazy, uh, and they're, and they're starting to to use that for really high defin, definition imagery as well. So there's all sorts of ways of capturing imagery remotely. Um, drones, obviously, the area that we do a bit of work with, uh, comes with uh, a range of of different approaches. Um, some great images off the site here. At, uh, at Loxton, uh, and thanks for, for Rachel, uh, who did a great job of getting her drone up above ours and, uh, and getting a bit of a deeper insight into some of the deep uh, spectral imaging around hyperspectral that we're having a look at uh, on site here uh, with Citrus. So really the thing here is, is well, what, what, what problem am I trying to fix? And Ollie touched on this is, and what are the things, if I'm thinking about using some kind of remote sensing technology, do I need to consider? Um, when I'm using that type of imagery? What, what are the things that might come into play? Might it be cloud? Might it be the weather? Uh, might it be the repeatability of a, <clears throat> excuse me, of a particular cycle of satellites, for instance? Uh, or is it simply, I've got a massive area to do and I'm not going to do that with a drone? Um, we had a crew out in Western Australia last week on uh, 1,500 uh, hectares of land um, doing spot sampling with a drone because that's all you can do over that large area. So. Um, really trying to tease through how you bring together the combinations of things that uh, might give you deeper insight into the problem that you've got, whether that be satellite, aircraft, or, or potentially drone, or anything else that we might come up with in the future as well. So what's driving decision making on farm? I think this is a really important story. Um, I'm not sure whether this video is going to work uh, straight up, but there's some videos. It's uh, John, I think, embedded them, so we'll see what happens. If not, um, we'll just work on with it. But this is a little story about uh, one of the growers that we work with up in the Clare Valley who is really trying to define his problem. Um, yeah, we've gone through a period of uh, you know, very dry, dry seasons. We've lacked the water that we've needed. And so it's become very important to try and get our production up to a level where we remain viable. So the key word there is viable. What's affecting him is very much this water issue about trying to understand the uniformity of irrigation, understand the complexities and variability on his farm. Um, but that key problem for him was variability in water and it's a real pain point for him. And so we've kind of been working through, well, how do we identify uh, a little bit better some of those uh, those problems on farm. And this is some of the imagery that we've been working with him to determine the variability of canopy uh, down to the per vine level. So this is where some of this starts to get super, super complex in detail of looking at the per vine level. And you might say, well, is that too much information for me? But it's about how you drill that information back out into something that's usable. And in Rob's case, what he's done here is, is to look more critically at this type of information to help him do some work on retrofitting his irrigation system to respond to those problems that he's seeing on his farm, which is essentially driven around that huge variability that he has in some of these blocks and getting those vines to better perform and being able to track this change over time. So both of those images, um, yeah, we've literally gone down and flown it uh, at, at super detail, four centimetres, and really starting to be able to measure using machine learning and algorithms to determine that growth change over time looking more deeply at the irrigation uh, aspects of water, water use efficiencies and, uh, and drilling into a bit of nutrition as well. So, yeah, cost decisions, targeted actions, absolutely. We've had to sort of reassess our management of the vineyard uh, and our management without a lot of water. Um, so we, we have to have that, we have to have a higher level of, of information that we can base this on. Um, we're now starting to look at uh, irrigation efficiencies and this imagery is actually showing up the poor state of our, our uh, 
you know, dripper systems. Mm. And we've actually now, on the strength of what's uh, happening this year, gone out and we're actually uh, rebuilding some of our original uh, irrigation systems. So we're replacing drip line and main lines to get that evenness throughout the vineyard. So that all, now all becomes more important because now we have to start looking at um, if the water's going out evenly, what else is happening? What other things are happening? It's not just water. Um, so again, this technology is going to be pretty handy for us. So going back to the discussions around collaboriculture and getting the language of data right, what Rob's been able to do now is start to pull in different information sources and align and layer those up over the information that we've put into a basic format of, of mapping and, and spatial imagery so that he can start to see the other things that are play. So what he was talking about there was he's saying, OK, we know we've got a problem with water. We know we've got a problem with this uh, variability issue. But there's other things at play. Once I've, once I've nailed that system, I know I've got my uniformity of distribution and irrigation correct. I know I've got my pressures right. If I'm still seeing the variability, what is it that's driving that? So get my soil maps over the top, get my, get my nutritional information over the top and try and drill in and see what, what are the key things that are driving those problems uh, and enabling me to have a, a better opportunity to, to address those other key factors about growth over time. So it's been really, really eye-opening for him on this particular block. Um, so some of that mapping has, has obviously gone down to, uh, yeah, just getting the basics right. And uh, Collaborate Culture, I think, has talked a lot about this, getting the basics right, is what are the defined boundaries? Are we talking about uh, where, where does your block start? Is it the headland? Uh, is it the corner post? What is it? What are, you, what are you driving towards? And more laterally now, with more of a focus uh, starting to become on the potentials for robotics, we're seeing how important it is to get precise locations of posts. Um, that's a real challenge for robots to come out into a field and suddenly find that there are all these posts in the way, that there are all these plants in the way. So how do we align in the mid-row between those posts so that that robot can go through and do its uh, robot tractor kit with its implements can go and do what it needs to do? So it all starts with this, this level of uh, precision uh, measurement. So Rob, Rob's an interesting character. He's uh, got a very diverse business. Uh, he's got chicken sheds. He's got uh, export hay. Uh, and he's got uh, yeah, livestock uh, and meat interests as well. So he's seen a little bit of where this journey into to, to ag tech uh, has come from and his observations are, are pretty interesting. Right? We've got guidance systems and all that yeah. set up on Broadacre. And my, my real strong feeling is in, in viticulture, it is a long way behind Broadacre. Broadacre is already adapting a lot of this mm. technology, mm. Um, certainly satellite technology and, and the rest. And whereas in viticulture, smaller areas, we need more detail. We simply mm. need that real detail that perhaps they don't uh, require to the same level. So really looking at how do we take some of that more traditional technology that we've seen driven by the Broadacre industry from a mapping perspective, getting it into GPS systems, variable rate applications and so forth coming into the more intensive horticultural systems and we're seeing a lot of that action happening uh, in spot spraying around uh, in the ap apple industry for instance uh, in being able to time those sprays reduce massive cost around spray applications and so forth i think we've still got a little way to go yet in terms of viticulture and getting to that point but the opportunities are clearly there particularly when we get down to this ability to see things in in uh, extreme detail um, so sort of finally from rob these guys came into our lives and wanted to uh, do some trial work with, um, you know, imagery and um, look at just develop from there. We, we saw the benefit and the biggest benefit to me is that um, very, very uh, accurate um, mapping. We're down to, what is it, uh, a centimetre, a couple of centimetres. Couple yeah. of centimetres. Yeah. This is a developing technology and if we're developing with you, uh, we get the added benefit of not only being able to learn what you're producing, um, we're actually part of it. This notion of partnerships is critical and it was really encouraging to have a few drinks and a, and a meal with the ag tech community in the, in the, uh, the tent next door last night at uh, the Loxon Hotel. There's a really strong camaraderie in this industry and I think this is the partnerships issue is as a grower clearly you want that partnership and I, I see really strong commitment from the providers that, that are here and in the whole ag tech community to develop that partnership approach. Um, 
I think there's suspicion around give me a credit card number and we'll charge you $9.99 a month and you'll never see anyone. I think that's not what farming is about in my mind. It's about developing these longer term relationships where we can unpack these problems. As Ollie said, we make mistakes every day in this technology uh, space. It is just moving so fast, it's almost impossible to keep up with every single new thing that comes along. Uh, and sometimes we make wrong decisions. But when we're doing and testing it in partnership with, with growers that want to be on that journey, we have a lot better chance of getting it right. And then I think as a community, as, as industries, we all win from that. So I think we feel really, really positive about those relationships that we're building out across uh, the, the ag community. And I think all the providers in the room would probably have exactly that same message. And it's, it's yeah, it's super encouraging to, to see that. And I, I think back to, uh, you know, the early 90s in uh, being fortunate enough to install uh, a couple of the very early versions of the Centex soil moisture devices with Pete Buss uh, out uh, in a paddock in, in the, um, in, in the um, Barossa region. And yeah, it has come such a long way in that period of time. And it's uh, really, really encouraging to, to see it developing out like that. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about some more about the accuracy issues. I think I could come back to that, because there's, uh, there's a couple of slides that I missed earlier on that um, I just want to refocus on. And Ollie touched on this uh, about the connections into things like sustainable wine growing Australia. And I think that's really important. Um, our background uh, for much of the last 20 or, or so years has actually been all about this, uh, which is how to think in systems. And it's about sustainability and it's about some of the things that are driving uh, overall thinking. And there's huge confusion out there when you look at the total amount of tech that's available and it's really hard <laughs> to find your way through that sometimes and work out what's the right solution for me. Um, it's a busy space and so I come back to this notion of, of uh, finding the right partnership. Um, what am I looking at? What am I trying to find through in the way of a problem? But some of those things um, really ultimately drive into this slide which is it is data driven. Um, it is about being able to compile an overall story uh, and something that you can trust that gives you this change over time picture that you can help shape your decisions around. And that all fits nicely into this whole plan, do, check, act, um, sustainability framework, uh, change framework that's been around for 40, 50 years. There's nothing new in that, um, but it definitely influences how we make decisions. Um, and we, we, you know, there's a lot of, I guess, issues in there that uh, easy things to say. You, the age-old adage of, you know, you can't manage it if you're not measuring it. Well, it's so true. Um, and this is the data-driven experience that we're all going to continue to have now in a massive way because it is just going at such a fast rate uh, with that. Uh, and in, I guess in this context of we're dealing with a, a scenario that we haven't really dealt with before. We've dealt with elements of this before, pandemics uh, a long time ago, uh, absolutely. But we're dealing with this in a cocktail of uh, a very different economic climate at the moment, uh, on the back of recovery around the pandemic and this spectre of climate change, which um, regardless of how you feel about that, um, is driving a lot of things on farm in a way that we just simply don't yet understand. And so having this information and this clarity of data sitting behind us is going to have you in a much better place uh, compared to trying to second guess uh, what's going to happen in certain situations. So, um, yeah, you know, resilience building for all of our businesses, regardless of, of, of what type of business we are, is fundamentally about uh, that diversity and, uh, and developing really strong resilient systems and um, information and spatial data is just one of those ways to get that base uh, in a really good, um, a really good solid foundation to start off with. So just uh, back through to uh, where I was going to round out uh, and leave it open for uh. a few questions is really just, I think, wanting to um, come back to this partnerships issue, yes, and this level of detail. Um, Rob's disappeared on me, but it's okay. It's really what he was trying to say with these, these, these insights from an ag tech user. Um, really knowing your problem, knowing how to tackle and use the right tools for the job, critical. Um, understanding what it is that uh, you're going to spend on this type of journey with regardless of whether it be uh, spatial and remote sensing type uh, information, uh, but any form of other ag tech solution 
and really understanding how you're going to put that into place. Um, I think number six is really, really critical. I think when you look at uh, all of the issues out on farm, including mental health, one of the things that we do not do well here is in the farming sector is value our own time and we've got to get better at doing that as well. And so that should be considered in the, in the return on investment. If I'm going to put in a, you know, 100, 100 hours, 120 hours in a week, um, then you know, really what does that mean in terms of the overall benefit of my farm? Have I really worked out what the, what the impact uh, of that is on my life and on my farm and the longevity of, of all of those. So I think that's a really critical issue to consider. Um, and you know, finally I think it's just this, this absolute picture because we're adults and we work in this kind of spatial and visual way is this change over time issue of being able to really look at things from 5, 10, 15 years ago and actually fundamentally just see that change and it can be quite stark. Um, that image uh, previously from North Africa with the pivots was a really good example of that. I'm sorry we didn't quite get that up there, but yeah, I think there was something like two and a half thousand pivots in that image uh, when it came through to, to 2021. You go back 15 years ago, there was nothing there. So that's, you know, that's extraordinary in terms of that change of landscape um, o over time. And um, today's not really a talk about carbon, but there's a lot of work happening in that space, above ground carbon monitoring that uh, we're, we're starting to bring in more of these spatial techniques to understand what that change in landscape looks like and uh, the pastoral regions uh, are no stranger to being able to have a look at that change over time and understand what that means from a, a farm longevity as well as uh, just collecting baseline information. So that's probably pretty much it from me. I reckon I've maybe caught up on a few minutes. Um, there was a race through, but uh, yeah, any questions? Thanks, Andy, for that presentation. Uh, Mike Krause from Planner Profit Agri. We're sort of set up to help farmers look at their profitability by patch or by variety. And I keep looking at those images that are developed by satellite and drone and saying, OK, what can we do with that to help farmers to you know, say, OK, is it more investing in irrigation? Is that the problem? How do you determine from those images whether it's an irrigation issue or it's a nutrient issue or it's a soil issue? or it might even be a weed issue. And then sort of forward projecting, if we change that colour from green to red, to what does that sure. mean from a productivity perspective? Yeah, great question. Um, we'll probably run through a few of those images over the afternoon in the, uh, in the tent next door. Um, generally, when a lot of those maps are presented, they're presented as a specific issue. So the one that I showed up was actually canopy variability. So we're, we're measuring the the change in canopy over time, so particularly useful for things like Utipa, uh, dieback in vines and understanding how that's creeping in with more um, gaps, uh, reduced cordon actually growing anything productive. So it's a measure of the productive capability uh, of the vineyard. Um, other of those colours potentially are around nitrogen deficiency or um, other macronutrients that we can specifically show the variability in those, in those nutrients so it can help guide action and decision making around nutrition. Um, and then specific algorithms that have been developed for weed identification. So we can actually fly through areas now and say that is weed X, that is weed Y. And that's really useful from monitoring is that becoming more problematic? Is that particular weed growing in significance? Um, or where is it so that I can go out and spot spray it? So we're seeing some awesome uh, development in that uh, area now where we've got spray units going out and targeting selectively the actual weed problem and for massively reducing the amount of costs associated with those herbicides. So it's about presenting the information in a format that's directly linked to that ROI. Any other questions you might have? Nope, looks like you're off the hook. Round of applause, please. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Well done.